Welcome everybody to today's FT Live and FPS seminar on supporting farmer innovation in Europe. What will shape European life sciences in the decades to come? I'm Hannah Kuschler, the FT's global farmer correspondent. I'm really excited to have you and a wonderful bank of speakers with us here today. European innovation has played a crucial role in the response to COVID-19. The best-selling vaccine created by BioNTech in Germany, the cheap and easy to distribute new vaccine that's helped save lives across lower and middle income countries, as well as in the West, came from the team at Oxford and their UK-based partner AstraZeneca. Those vital COVID-19 tests were made by Roche and Kyogen, and those life-saving antibody treatments by Roche and GlaxoSmithKline. But the pandemic also sparked a boom in biotech initial public offerings, the vast majority of which went public over the Atlantic on the Nasdaq. It highlighted yet again concerns about whether fantastic academic science is as easy to translate into companies in Europe as it is in the US, and questions about how to encourage follow-on capital that allows companies to stay at home. This panel comes at a really important time in the development of the European Commission's new pharmaceutical strategy, and I'm pleased to welcome Sandra Galina, Director General for the Health and Food Safety at the EC. Sandra tells me she will not be spilling the beans on the new strategy, which is still very much under development, um, but we will hear from her you know, how she's thinking about it going forward. We also have a couple of fantastic representatives from the pharma industry, Stefan Ehrlich from Bayer and Bill Anderson from Roche, who I hope will also be able to give us an American's eye view of Europe. I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Um, you can type them in the um, box at the right hand side of the screen, it's a Q&A box, um, and you can share your thoughts and tweets on social media using the hashtag FTDigitalDialogues. I think that, um, when they come in, if they're irrelevant to what we're speaking as we go along, I might ask them in the process. If not, um, we keep some side, time aside at the end so we make sure we can get to them. So first of all, thank you all for joining. And um, I think that the most important thing is to talk about if, what the current barriers are to pharma innovation in Europe before we start putting our heads together and deciding how, how we might fix them. So, Stefan, starting with you, I mean, what do you think the most significant issues are? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, thanks for having me, Hannah, here on this panel. Um, before we talk uh, only about issues, let's uh, not forget the fact that uh, uh, European science continues to be strong. You gave the AstraZeneca example uh, with Oxford. Uh, in general, if we look at the global share of scientific publications that, uh, that are done worldwide, uh, Europe is still together now with China in the lead with about a little over 20% of, of all publications. That's actually more that comes out of the US. Uh, so the question is, why does that not translate into... Uh, a um, effervescent biotech sector like uh, like we see it in in the US and, and and I think there the funding mechanisms are different and and I think we we will have to discuss that maybe also on this panel a little bit and uh, the the access to capital is different in Europe than it is uh, in in the US and we'll have to also see how we channel capital flows maybe a little bit more effectively uh, so that uh, Europe is not just uh, the place where we breed out all the good ideas, but where we also can capitalize on some of the value chains that should go with that. Yeah, I mean, do you think it really matters if, uh, you know, if innovation is happening in Europe, does it matter if a European company goes public on the NASDAQ? Well, right now there's really no alternative to going public on the NASDAQ because you will not be able to raise anything in the order of magnitude of $200 million uh, or euros or more uh, to get a company going uh, with the late, later stage clinical development uh, funding needs. So right now there's nothing comparative, uh, comparable to that. I think this is something that uh, we as Europeans should ask ourselves uh, if we uh, cannot create the conditions under which we can create similar capital markets as we see in the US. But let's not fool ourselves. That's not something that we can just decide uh, by a political uh, stroke of imagination. This is something that, that will take time. And in, in between, 
uh, I think there are now good examples that show that uh, NASDAQ listing is possible while keeping value chains here in Europe and building them up. Uh, think of companies like BioNTech, for example, who are NASDAQ listed, but uh, strongly invested and rooted in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic example of that. Now, Bill, um, what do you think? I mean, you're obviously an American in Europe. How, how does the uh, Europe compare to the US and in fact, China, when you're making choices about where to invest? Yeah, I, I think, as, as Stefan said, there's there's a lot of uh, good news. There's reasons for optimism. I mean, the, the historical impact of Europe in life sciences and in uh, just yeah, scientific and de development and innovation has been really strong. And a lot of those fundamentals are, are still there. Um, I think there's, there is a challenge with valuing innovation. And uh, we've seen this in industry after industry. The companies that are innovating, they tend to go and invest in the places where that innovation is most valued and frankly is, is reimbursed. And, uh, and so... You know, I, I think there's a danger that sometimes people overlook the obvious. They think of, you know, some sophisticated industrial strategy when really the thing that's more needed is just a, a healthy environment and support for innovative medicines when they're available, that they're actually covered and that they're covered rapidly uh, and, and widely adopted because that's, that's what makes for a healthy infrastructure, makes for a healthy environment for development of, of, the, next, of the next great thing. So you think that maybe we're a little bit too obsessed with the idea that medical innovation should be happening on our continent, as long as we can make sure that people on the continent benefit from it? No, it's not so much that. I, I think uh, I think Europeans should demand that innovation is happening on on uh, the continent here. And it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's one of the most dynamic industries. It's something that is positive in terms of jobs, in terms of the economy, in terms of giving people uh, great livelihoods that, that allows them to do you know, interesting work. It's just that when you say, okay, so how do you do that? How do you make sure that the industry is healthy and strong and investing in Europe? And I'm saying maybe the simplest answer is make sure it's a, it's a, there's a friendly reception for innovative new medicines when they arrive. Uh, because you know, companies, industries tend to go to the places where the environment is most favorable. And so you can have lots of, say, industrial policy, but if you don't reimburse medicines, you don't value them when they're available, then that's, that's not a good environment for innovation. Yeah, well, I think we're definitely going to get on to, you know, more, more in depth on issues about access and, and value and in the chain. Um, just going back to the point on China, though, because we are so used to comparing Europe and the US, how, how do you think um, Europe will need to change as, as China sort of rises as a biotech power? Well, I, I think, you know, China certainly represents a country of great strength when it comes to innovation. Um, and again, they, they have uh, both, you know, a, a populace that is highly educated uh, that is is anxious to um, yeah basically invest lives and careers in science and technology, and so I think it's just another opportunity for Europe to say, hmm, you know, we we can't be complacent here. We need to be making sure that we're not only doing the right things, say at universities in terms of of educating people, but we're creating that environment where uh, you know a friendly environment for uh, uh, companies to invest and to be able to, to see the, the innovation they're making and the investments they're making rewarded in the markets. So Sandra, you are obviously playing an important role in, in helping to shape this coming pharmaceutical and industrial strategy with the idea that it should support a research ecosystem that delivers the next generation of treatments and cures. I know that you're not ready to tell us what you're thinking exactly, but but what are you hearing from stakeholders about what they would like to see? Now, it's not that I can't tell what we think, it's that, you know, the game to take out such a reform is a monumental one. The process is quite long. So let me say, I don't think it would be fair to say, we will get this because, you know, there are so many variables that uh, 
that it would be impossible. What I think it's important is that I tell you what, I, what we have picked up. First of all, I think we all now, at least uh, the colleagues that I have around me, are a bit less uh, inhibited on the issue of money. Uh, I have come onto this job looking at people that, oh, money, no, money counts. And uh, may I say the pharmaceutical sector is a major contributor to the EU economy. When we do a few, I would say, countings, um, it's not far from 25 billion, but, you know, this depends on what you want to take in, sold, not sold, what you're doing. Uh, and with that goes uh, lots of livelihoods, households that depend and, you know, let me say, living in Belgium, I can see that there is a huge district that lives uh, from pharmaceutical uh, companies or, let's say, plants. We, we, we may have uh, different ways of looking at this. So I was very interested in what Bill was saying locating, not locating, what does it mean? It's always a, a bit of a complicated uh, discussion inside uh, Europe. There has been recently this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, motto of strategic autonomy. So let me say there are ideas around. For us, what is important is to, first of all, understand that this pharmaceutical um, revision will be a priority, is a priority. It comes from well before COVID. Eh? It was already in the headline ambitions. Uh, then you need to be really lucid on the fact that um, after what happened with the pandemic, uh, there is this, this hankering for a market from Uppsala to, Luma, to Limassol, as I always say with the vaccines, meaning that Europeans want to feel treated the same wherever they are. So, you know, this is perhaps a very long-term project, but we need to pick up this idea that the patient-centered, uh, I would say, model is the one that is being requested. Obviously, um, when we have been working over the last few months on the pandemic, no shortcuts were made in terms of safety or in terms of, I would say, quality of the medicine. But let me say there is an issue which is called competitiveness. And this is not just European competitiveness. We are a small pond. It's global competitiveness. What you were mentioning, Hannah, about China and US appeals a lot to me. So let me say we need to treat this sector or the sector itself needs to live up to its importance. And I think its importance goes also with the amount of research. Um, the money that is being spent on, on research is huge now. Uh, we could always do more, uh, but when, when we go through the numbers, 20% of all the research spending goes to this, to this sector. And, and it's huge now. The, the absolute terms perhaps mm, we may discuss, but it, the fact that so much is devoted to this sector means that we need to get more out of all that we do. What is missing, uh, I am sure we will have very good ideas from this chat. I have already heard investment, an investment friendly uh, environment. Um, we need to be able also to produce something which is future proof, the digital part, digital advances. So let me say that the European health data space is for me an inevitable element in all this discussion because we are sitting on piles of data. Uh, and here we need to be neither, I would say, um, the US nor China. We will need to go our own way with the data. But, you know, this is a resource. And I think that in addition to the digital strand, there is this uh, streamlining, let's put a nice word on it, streamlining of the regulatory procedures. I think that that could foster innovation in the sense that when you're asking, does it matter that innovation stays in Europe or not? Of course it matters. Of course it matters. I want to have uh, innovative companies in Europe. Otherwise, we will always be like only takers of technology. And that is not never too good. So important, but the companies that innovate need to feel that they are appreciated. Uh, uh, I can see in the chat fantastic points that are being made. And, you know, one of my saddest moments was when I was in a, in a, in a bit of an event and someone said, oh, uh, perhaps uh, the person was not very lucid that I was amongst the audience. But, you know, he said, ah, you know, to all of you. And he was addressing a, a bunch of, uh, of people that were uh, sort of uh, startups, you know, uh, I would, I would uh, only tell you come to the US sooner. 
uh, you know, for me, that was like a, a stab in the heart because, you know, I want to keep startups start here. Obviously, um, this goes with a different, perhaps, uh, approach to investment. There are many topics that go with it, but our strength is that we are a huge market. We also are a relatively rich market if we want to, to go uh, in terms of, of distribution. But I would say we can go into the discussion to other points incentives incentives for the places where we have unmet needs but also incentives to go innovative to go with the digitalization that we need and here you will need the infrastructure but that is a separate chapter and you mentioned the pandemic do you think that it changed european policy oh, makers yeah. approach to the industry oh, i'm sure it changed <laughs> to the industry i i think that you know there is a a stronger realization that you know it is extremely important to team up with industry to have a good relationship to get the best uh, out of it and i think it can be a win win relationship so we need to be very lucid that the expectations especially i'm talking about the member states who were exposed to um, how we proceeded uh, in the vaccines and they can make the difference with other uh, approaches you know that we have had in the joint procurement for instance that was not particularly I would say liked by member states I think they have now a, a vision of themselves as much more um, active partners now what what will this mean in terms of the reform I think there are two elements you need to be very much aware and I hope I'm addressing um, a very wide audience of I would say the industry um, uh, part of the stakeholders you need to be aware that uh, somehow shortages are no longer accepted the fact that you because you live in a country you don't have a certain um, medicine is not good so we need innovative medicines for all Europeans at least that is how I interpret the mission that was given to me by by the president and by the current commissioner um, having innovative uh, medicines for all is the is the element then there are topics such as affordability because you know they're cash strapped uh, uh, budgets uh, and here you know there are other elements that we need to have in mind but perhaps one can summarize saying that there is a clear realization that uh, much as you can determine your relationship with the pharma industry, the pharma industry is uh, the element that can be crucial in safeguarding the health of your population. So I think that that is perhaps was present already earlier, but this is something that is uh, useful. On the other hand, there is also the realization that together we did something that was much better for all. So let us hope that all this comes to fruition in the reform. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let's um, let's turn then to our um, our former colleagues. Um, what do you hope? I'm going to start with, with Stefan. What do you hope that um, European policymakers will take away from the pandemic experience about the value of innovation and and how that will sort of go forward as they think about policies around access? Well, Hannah, I think uh, first we have to see that uh, dialogue with policymakers, at least in my professional lifetime, has never been uh, so intense and so constructive and productive as I've seen it over the past 24 months. And when you speak to each other and when you uh, fight a common enemy, uh, that builds trust and that uh, builds a different level of, uh, of communication overall. And it is up to us to preserve this and to build on this and, and to do more. I think uh, Sandra is a good example here uh, as she's part of this panel, because I, I think uh, I can see in, uh, in policymakers and in uh, and also parts of the administration a, a, a larger openness to understand the, uh, the value capture that can happen through the pharmaceutical industry. Sandra said it in her initial uh, statement. I mean, you take the uh, health a sector in in itself, uh, that's about ten percent of the GDP of uh, of the European Union. So this is a major economic factor for everyone. If we now try to also uh, systematically enhance those parts that create the largest value 
uh, also for uh, in terms of wealth creation for Europe and uh, systematically build on innovation, then uh, I think we have a potential uh, winning formula. And that's something that I think our industry is now also much more explicit about how we can get there. Of course, Bill is right when he said you also need to have market conditions that uh, render it attractive to have an industrial and a research and development infrastructure that is uh, based in Europe and works out of Europe. But I think these things are more and more coming together. Uh, so so I'm, I'm optimistic there, but I'm not naive. So, so this is something that we need to fight for every day. And I know that once the pandemic is over, there will be other political uh, priorities that will kick into gear. So we need to demonstrate the value that we can create. And I, I think the pandemic has impressively shown that. But there are many other topics. Think about cancer, think about cardiovascular disease, and think about the impact that they have macroeconomically as disease burden on, uh, on all of us. So cardiovascular disease, for example, is estimated to cost Europe about 210 billion euros every year. Uh, and the part of uh, using medicines to, to beat that is actually a, just a small, small fraction of it. So if we can uh, improve productivity on the innovation side there, it can have a major impact. Cancer is just another wonderful example for that. Mm. Yeah, so Bill, you did bring up access earlier. Do you think that the pandemic has changed policymakers' approach or, or do you uh, share maybe Stefan's apprehension that uh, it could all just uh, go back to business as usual and, and people can have other priorities? Mm. Not least, of course, the sort of saving money for health systems, which have been very stretched during the pandemic. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think the pandemic was a great example of what can be done when there's a crisis. Now, the question is, is, you know, is speeding innovative, life-saving new cancer drugs to patients, is, is that a crisis or maybe not, you know? And I, I think we would argue that, yeah, we should apply that same sense of urgency to bringing new medicines to patients that are you know, have, have life-threatening diseases, that should happen all the time. And so, you know, for example, in the U.S., the review cycle uh, from the time a medicine is filed to approval averages about 250 days. In, in the EU, that's about 400 days. Um, but that's not the end of the challenge. So that's 150 days, almost half a year additional time to wait. But then in many EU countries, there's then an additional period once the drug is approved before it's actually covered for patients. Uh, and th there's you know, central reimbursement proceedings and things that can add another six months, another 12 months, uh, even years onto the process. And again, we, we find ourselves sometimes in this irony of, of having governments come to us say, hey, we wanna talk to you about uh, uh, your strategy for developing new cancer medicines or for innovating uh, Alzheimer's medicines. We want to tackle these diseases, but some of those same countries have these extremely long uh, processes for, for reviewing and, and funding new medicines. And, and that's where I think there's uh, maybe at times there's some complex answers being sought uh, to maybe simpler problems. That's interesting. So one of our... Um... Uh, audience has asked a question which um, you might be able to handle. You've probably half answered already, but I'm going to put it to you. This is last year, Bluebird Bio withdrew an innovative gene therapy for a rare disease from the European market, then wound down its overall operations in the region. Why do you think this happened and what can we do to ensure European patients have access to these therapies in the future? I'm going to ask Bill and then I'm going to ask Sandra what she thinks. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, first off, I'm not sure I can comment on a, on a specific incidence because I'm sure there are a lot of, uh, you know, sort of special circumstances involved. But I would just say in general, uh, you know, there is more of a willingness to fund innovative medicines in some countries than others. And I think the U.S. historically has been the leader there. Uh, and, and so a, a young company, especially startups, if they're doing something really innovative, and I think in this example, there it's the context of a, a one-time treatment, sort of a curative treatment. And obviously, if you have a curative treatment for a, a serious medical condition, that, that treatment could lead not only to saving someone's life, but also to the avoidance of literally millions of dollars of healthcare costs 
for, for a single patient. Uh, and, and so, uh, but on the other hand, these therapies can be really expensive to develop because, you know, if you have a disease that only affects maybe a few hundred people in the world, it still can cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars to develop such a thing, even though you might only be treating, uh, you know, a small number of patients. In the U.S., there's been historically an assumption that somehow this will be covered. And generally, that's been true. And so I, I think, uh, again, you know, th there's this idea of, are we willing to fund therapies when they're made available? I, I think that's really the key. Yeah, yeah. Sandra, I mean, there are more and more of these kind of, you know, one-off curative treatment for rare diseases. Do you think that um, there are new, new approaches needed in Europe to paying for these? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not com convinced about the fact that, you know, the market will take care of itself, meaning that we have a lot of, uh, of pressure to find a solution for these unmet needs or rare diseases or uh, orphans. Uh, we, we can put a big bag and big labels. So let me say, for us, definitely incentives for innovation uh, for these unmet needs will be there. We need to, to, to invest if we want to have a solution for this, because it's obvious that uh, we cannot have uh, people just because they have a rare disease uh, uh, not covered. I must say that um, the uh, degenerative uh, diseases are certainly high in the list of the stakeholders consultation we have. So let me say the world has changed. The world does not accept that because it's rare, it does not have a treatment. So. I'm happy if in other parts of the world this takes care of itself, but we have not been very successful in this. So we will need to tackle that. Not a simple issue. It's complex, but we are fully committed on, on, on finding a solution. There were many things that were said that appealed to me. Um, you know, uh, yes, the, 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 the private-public uh, partnerships or public-public partnerships, the money that... Uh, put there it's all very good but let me say when we were working on the vaccines for instance one of the things that were most visible for us was the um, absence of clinical trials and let me say that uh, whilst I was here there was the approval finally of the HTA yeah? um, uh, the HTA let me say will need three years before it's, uh, it's up and running but, you know, it should be very important in creating a single hub for the assessment because the thing that was mentioned here that it would take time and time and months before the, 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 the treatment would get to the patients is really very painful to accept. So we are trying our best. Um, I, I think that um, the clinical trials that will hopefully work well and we'll start on the 31st of January. Um, it's, it's perhaps something that is helpful. Sometimes, you know, you as, a, as an innovator, you go to the US also because you can be hosted by those who have the ability to uh, give you the, the, the power for, for all the trials that you need before you can even access a file in your mind uh, to present. So, before we talk about um, about regulation downstream, there is this initial part that is required, and definitely money. But let, let me say, money, I think we have money. Uh, money we have in the EU for health, 5.3 billion, whether they are spent uh, by DG Sante or by HERA, that's not, not necessarily so important. For instance, there is this silent pandemic, as many say, of the antibiotics. I hope that we will be able to tackle that. We have huge money in the next generation EU. Let me say that when we were counting uh, all the plans that were there, um, uh, you know, at least 37 billion have been put aside by member states uh, for all that is health. But there is an issue here in the fact that there is the hardware and the software. Much of this uh, money goes for the hardware. There needs to be also a bit of soft software, so better public uh, health approaches in the member states, a bit more preparedness. And here, let me say, we need to find a balance with industry because you have in your drawers innovative things. You have the future. And uh, you know to unlock that future, perhaps you need uh, something from our side. Which, which entices that. And uh, in the vaccines, it was very clear. 
that uh, we could have, um, I would say, an approach which was uh, based on, on an initial grant. Um, I would say in the case of therapies and medicines for diseases like cancer and all, there is also a regulatory part. So uh, there's, there's a huge uh, set of elements. I hope you can discern where we are. We are in a place where unmet needs need to be met. Affordability is certainly an issue. Shortages are very important, but you know, most of all, we would like to have the most innovative treatments also in Europe. And here I'm personally very committed because it's not fair that we develop them. You know, our students go to university, then there is a lot of research that is being paid, then we may even pay the company for research, and then the innovation goes somewhere else. This is really not, not good for Europe. So we hope to be able to keep these innovations here. And, and, uh, and I think we need to think carefully about which is the incentive that is needed. Huh? It's, um, it's not only money, not only money, I think. I think that's a really important point as well. When we look at in investment, we tend to think of, you know, big VC rounds that get published in you know papers like ours um but but not the investment that goes into the the people and the academic science which is you know the most important building blocks there's a lot of questions coming in from the audience about clinical trials so um and the rules and, and changes that there could be made there to speed things up obviously the pandemic um really did show how some of that can be done um, i'll go to you stefan first with a couple of questions and i'll um i'll uh, come back to Bill afterwards. So, um, you know, one is, why do you think the number of clinical trials registered with the FDA out, outnumbers almost tenfold the number in Europe? I don't know if that stat's correct, but I'm going to presume our audience member is right. Um, and how can collaboration between regula regulators in the US and the EU be facilitated to cooperate routinely on approvals of the same drugs? Stefan, do you want to take a shot of that first? So the first question, I think, has a has a pretty easy answer, uh, and it's all about uh, uh, where those companies are located and where the value chains have been established. It's uh, much easier to reach out if you're located in Cambridge uh, to Brigham's uh, uh, than it is uh, to reach out to I don't know a APHB in Paris. Uh, because you're just around the corner and uh, so it just comes more natural also your recruiting ground locally will be much more prone to to be attached to those uh local sites so i don't think that the science is necessarily better or worse also it's easier uh when you uh want to go for fda approval uh that you use u.s uh sites and if that's your priority uh then then U u.s comes to mind first um, it, it always comes back to the same thing. We need to make the market conditions in Europe such that also uh, getting an EMA approval is seen to be as valuable as getting an FDA approval quickly. And then also having companies based out of Europe uh, creates uh, this, let's say, just geographical link into the clinical, um, into the clinical scene that we may not have to the same degree today. Um, so, so to me, that, that those those go together. Hmm. And Bill, um, what what do you think to those questions? And and I will also just add in that there's a lot of interest in how um, other tools, not regulatory tools, can be used to to speed up um, clinical trials, including um, AI and um, uh, the uh, well, no, this is a better integrating digital tools and biomarkers. Yeah, I. I wish I could say that the solutions to all these things is, is technology, but I don't really think that's the case. I think it's usually, um, you know, kind of the human systems keeping pace with the technology. And I think in, in the case of clinical trials, there's a lot of innovation that could happen that would really speed things up and reduce costs. Uh, it would make, but that what it does require is is sort of old school uh, or not old school but old you know old fashioned agreement between regulators in different jurisdictions about different requirements. So let me give you one example that that is meaningful uh, in in cancer trials. The standard that's generally required by regulators on both sides of the Atlantic is a, a central review of the images 
you know, of the, of the uh, radiographic images of the cancer, okay? And this is for things like determining whether a cancer has progressed or not, which is a major endpoint in, in cancer. Uh, thing is, those, those images all have to be read at the, at the local sites, and then they have to be submitted to a central review, and then the central review reviews it. And so you basically do everything twice. Now, it's been shown for over a decade that there's no difference whatsoever between the results you get if you use the, the local investigator review versus the central review. Nevertheless, there's been no agreement to drop that central requirement. You know, and, that, and that's just one of, I, I can list, you know, th there's, there's hundreds of these things that increase the complexity of clinical trials. They increase the cost of clinical trials. They increase the burden on patients because they have to go through mo more measures, more tests, more blood draws, more, you know. And, and so um, this is a system that could really use an overhaul and a simplification to what's most important so that we could have much more streamlined clinical trials that we could make those, those trials accessible in, in more remote sites. So it doesn't always have to be the big academic centers. Um, and, and honestly, we, we could save a lot of money from the cost of development, which would translate directly into lower priced medicines. But it's, it's a, you know, it, it, yeah, as I said, it's an old fashioned kind of problem that requires people rolling up their sleeves and, and coming together on it. And uh, that, that's difficult work. And, and maybe, Sandra, do you think, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Sorry, just to add to that, we've seen lately also during the pandemic, the FDA take action, for example, on oncology uh, to, uh, to change the threshold uh, uh, in terms of, of timings and, and also evidence being brought to as, as long as really you see some breakthrough uh, in, uh, for patients to really shorten timelines. And uh, I had to say this, uh, Sandra, but now that the UK is out, uh, the UK is also trying to position itself as, as a country that advances uh, certain standards uh, at a different pace so that also uh, access could, uh, to, to innovation could be, to, could be shortened. Similar to some of the US initiatives, I think Europe would be well served to follow here. Or maybe not to follow, take, take the lead. Yeah, can, can I just insert here that um, Europe has led out on the, the uh, area of uh, review and approvals of clinical trials and having sort of a single approach there, which was just implemented last year. And I, I think that is the kind of progress that can streamline things and can, can lead to uh, better access to clinical trials for patients. So there, there is, you know, pr progress happens and, and Europe is capable of leading on this. And I think we just need to come together with the authorities in Europe and, and make more of that happen. So Sandra, Europe is capable, but it's hard and it faces competition. What do yeah. you think is going to happen? Well, I only think I have 27 member states. I wish I had one, you know, sometimes. But you know, <laughs> the beauty of Europe, we are, we are united in diversity. So let me say to you, all that you were saying, I have, in a sense, in a very reduced scale, lived through. So I may say to you that there is... Um, uh, always this issue of, first of all, safety. Safety needs to be there. And therefore, you know, uh, there is an angle which, which we need to cover and it needs to be covered without any doubt. Then uh, from that angle comes a whole set of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, crystallized situations, uh, positions of rent, uh, uh, different elements that are in the system. So let me say, for me, we are all in good faith and trying to improve. And when I saw the effects that the pandemic had, it was very telling the pressure, the pressure of uh, votes, because, you know, the pandemic would uh, create a very bad situation in a country. Let me say it's all political in the end, creates a certain desire to move the cursor. Let's say you always have this risk benefit analysis. You always have, you know, to assess whether that, for instance, there was a question, what is it that by joining forces EU and US can do? They can do a lot because, you know, FDA and EMA agreeing that for a certain thing in, in let, let me say, an updated vaccine, for instance, you need that type of trial and not 70 different, or it's not like you were starting from scratch. And it's good because if we are together, the US and the EU, people will understand that there is 
never a discount on the issue of quality and on the issue of safety. It's only that perhaps, you know, uh, trying to make something safe is not about ticking all the boxes that you need to, to that you want to tick. You need to tick those those elements that. Uh, but this is this is quite complex because the health it's always a very touchy issue. Um, it's it's also a place where you know you have an immediate uh, political ricochet. So let's be very very. Lucid, that we will need a joint piece of work here on how to streamline, simplify, and by the way, also make use of the new world that exists with digitalization. There is no remoteness anymore in my mind. The fact that you have even 3D printers, the fact that you can collect uh, and analyze in a, in a very far away place, and it's not close to the center, should be factored in. I mean, the future is not that you do everything in a center, which is logistically one place on Earth. You see what I mean? There are many, many things that we are not really doing. AI, by the way, we have plenty of AI that we can use. And so for me, we need to respect ourselves and go for the best solution and be ambitious. Be ambitious, try to aim at the best innovative treatment for Europeans, let me say, in all countries and Europeans in all countries with different GDPs. Uh, so this is the ambition. And for that ambition, you need to be also discussing with industry what is it that is needed. And here is where it will become, you know, very complex because the details are always in the hands also of national regulators national regulators by definition need to be in the picture with us. We, we, we need to have this part of the world, which is extremely important because they also take the part of responsibility when the situation uh, uh, is, is difficult, let's say. So many actors, many countries, but I suspect that if the effect of the pandemic remains, there will be a good path towards having innovation, staying in Europe and serving European citizens, you know, also for unmet needs, let me say. What a, what a mm. fantastic place that would be. Well, plenty of motivation, but plenty of complication, it sounds like. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in from the audience, which I love, so keep on sending them in. Um, this is um, a little bit, some of the questions are a little bit disparate, so I'll probably only go to one or two of you. Um, one says, you would think the ESG and the pharmaceutical industry are intimately linked, yet I hear almost nothing about the efforts the industry is making to promote the ESG agenda. How do you fill this void? You know, Bill or Stefan want to chime in on that one? Well, um, maybe I could give it a try. For, first off, I think the industry is doing a lot here. And I, I think, uh, how would I say, uh, if you, let's see, if you develop a new medicine that is able to treat early cancer patients and prevent their cancer from ever recurring, I don't know, is that contributing to ESG? Uh, I mean, I, I think we have to be careful that we don't just, um, I, I don't know, that, that we're not so focused on branding at ESG as much as doing things that are great for people or great for the planet. And so I think the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, I, I, as I make my travels, I see tremendous gains on things like CO2 emissions. But let's not forget that the biggest thing the pharmaceutical industry can do isn't about CO2 emissions. It's, it's saving lives through vaccines and medicines. And, uh, and, and in that case, I think we've never had such a pace of innovation as we have today. So. I, I think our, our record's remarkable. Maybe maybe we need to tell that story better, but uh, I, I don't think there's any gap there. Uh, yes, I there would is the branding. I, I would agree that we need to tell our story a little better. Um, the pace of innovation is unprecedented, uh, and uh, cancer is one facet. Uh, the COVID pandemic has been another uh, wonderful example for that. But I think we're making progress beyond that uh, as well. Uh, inequality on the planet is a major issue. And I think we have understood and heard this, uh, uh, the need for tiered pricing, for example, around the world, the need to, to, uh, to give different types of access schemes. So um, 
the um, really respond to the ability to also um, to also be able to pay for uh, for innovation. We just have to be careful that that doesn't turn around uh, and that uh, we we uh, we want the same then low pricing that we may find in uh, in, in country in developing countries uh, in the in the fully development com developed countries. But I think I think we're doing a lot. We're still continuing to invest across many, many companies into diseases uh, like tropical diseases um, that uh, that don't occur really in uh, in the in the rich part of the world and, and there are still investments going there. So so many many good things are happening and I would agree that we need to talk about this uh, more. I think we also need to strengthen the uh, the link of uh, policymakers that are in charge of um, uh, of of developing countries and 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 trying to come to their their support and, and helping them develop uh, because I think we can contribute a lot. I'm thinking about an initiative that uh, in in our com uh, company where we where we work on cardiovascular medicine in 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 an area like Ghana in Africa uh, on educating people on giving them access to uh, uh, to cardiovascular care and and things where we where we help them to help themselves uh, but also uh, give them give them the right access to uh, uh to these advances i'll think about areas like uh, like contraception in uh, in uh, in countries that where where there's low access to to contraception and and that creates a major uh economic and social uh continued uh lack, lack of balance uh, so so all of those things i think we're doing a lot uh, i know that uh, Bill, you're a great example, uh, also with with how you bring innovation into into those parts of the planet. Uh, so let's not forget uh, sometimes to talk about it. Mm. Stefan, um, maybe this other next question is also one for you. Um, the recent Lancet publication shows that 1.27 million people died from antibiotic resistance in 2019. How, um, this is the new emerging silent pandemic. How can we support more farmer investment into antibiotic R&D? It's obviously been a, a huge current issue at the moment. Well, many people talk about market failure when it comes to uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, because we have a situation here where we're trying to uh, create so-called reserve antibiotics that nobody uses, but then we want to pay them like we're paying for generic uh, antibiotics. So, so the market obviously... Uh, needs to be, we need to revisit some of the market logic here uh, and uh, and create the right incentives. So that's that's for one, uh, because otherwise uh, we will have, uh, we will have a continuation of large companies not investing into antibiotics. Uh, and and uh, there are quite a number of examples of that. We have recently come together a number of industry representatives to actually uh, um, create a fund uh, that is uh, aimed to uh, enable some of the early innovation that's out there and, and to, to, to fund them for late stage clinical development. It's the so-called so AMR Action Fund. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a joint effort of industry, but there's also, for example, the Wellcome Trust in, in there. And uh, that, that aims to tackle this, this issue. May not be enough, but I think it's, uh, it's a clear first sign. But I would also expect here from policymakers uh, to address this uh, this kind of market failure that we're seeing, when you the evidence that you need to bring to get uh, a premium price um, cannot be achieved under the current HDA assessment systems. No one is going to invest into that, so that needs to be addressed. Hmm. Sandra, there's a couple of uh, questions about data that might be uh, worth uh, you taking a look at. Um, one is currently the Digital Services Act is under discussion by European MPs. How could this impact the pharmaceutical industry? And there's another one that says, do you think the EU countries should be more open to ease data privacy in order to allow digitalization in certain areas of clinical trials? Um, during the pandemic, it was challenging to collect data from sites up from ongoing trials. Mm. Uh, on this on this latter point, I would like to say that uh, pharmacovigilance for the vaccines worked very, very well. Uh, I must tell you, we're picking up everything that was happening, so that is an exemplary way of going about things. Now, a few, a few points before I tackle the digital, uh, stimulated by what um, I would say both Bill and Stefan were saying, very interesting. Uh, 
And first of all, I would like to say that we have created Hera. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, Hera was created exactly to have this horizon scanning of the startups and picking up, I would say, uh, the right ones, uh, possibly rescuing them from the Valley of Death. Uh, as we all know. So in a sense, we have tried to get the means and uh, one of the of the files that Hera will be attending to is the AMR. So let me say it's exactly where we see this silent pandemic coming from. Uh, I must say that um, because there is also other bits and pieces in the chat that interest me like, you know, Poland versus mm -hmm. Germany and all these things. So let me be very frank. European patients have different access to medicines today. And after the vaccines experience, they are not very happy about that. They were not happy in the past, but perhaps more resigned. Today they say, no, I can get the same thing that others get. Now, availability and access or affordability of medicines, uh, you know, it's very big in all the member states agenda now. Um, Obviously, we can work with the, with the industry to improve uh, uh, medicines, uh, the access to medicines across Europe. Uh, this I don't deny, but let me say the reasons for the differences sometimes are multifactorial. So sometimes you have company business decisions. We were just mentioning how it's easy to hoover from a university that is close by rather than a, how I would say you live with national pricing and reimbursement policies. This is also another factor that goes into the mix. It's a business decision sometimes, you know. Then, you know, the, the way the health systems are organized, the way, um, I would say, the sizes of the populations of the member states. Let me say I had, I had, I have a serious problem because of Brexit with very small countries, in particular Malta and Cyprus, but also Ireland, because of the dependency from, from certain, I would say, uh, products. So let me say, uh, even if we were to solve uh, the, the cube, the, the, the rubric cube of, I would say, affordability from the side of, let's say, the budgets of the member states, the way they go about procurement, there is then, you know, how to regulate it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. And then, you know, finally for the shortages, you also have to be very careful not to have overdependence from supplies from abroad, from, I would say, one single supplier, which is, uh, which is not very smart. So in this strategic autonomy, I would say diversification of supplies is good also. So many factors. Um, so this is where I want to be very frank with you. The challenge is huge because there is not many factors also, but many actors with different, uh, with different, how can I say, votes and attraction of support from different sources. So this is this is where we need to be. Uh, I have no doubt that, for instance, when it comes to uh, AMR, doctors are very, very concerned about uh, the indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And we saw that in a recent discussion in Parliament. Um, they are very, very concerned about that. But then, you know, we have other, other actors in society that, uh, that have uh, different approaches to that. So coming to the digital part, digital. First of all, I want to share with you something which is perhaps uh, not necessarily big news, but um, I tend to have an excellent relationship with the Director General of DigiConnect, Roberto Viola, who is a very, I would say, um, uh, visionary mind. Uh, I like to work with him. And he is also very fond of my domain. Health is very interesting for him because health can be the place where we can get many more things up and running in an, in an easier way because there is this element that People want to be healthy, so you know it's inescapable. In other domains of uh, of digitalization, you can have aspirations, but here we need to be lucid. Uh, we have an immediate return with with what the people uh, feel they have. So, for me, there will be a clear, massive, um, how can I say, a quantum leap if we can use all that is available through digital. So. There are elements which, which pertain to 
the streamlining of procedures and this is just the tip of the iceberg i would say but then there are elements that become real substance for health like personalized medicine treatment like i would say using ai rather than relying on a doctor looking at your scan but having ai trying to go into the millions of, of permutations to see what size your cancer is what type of cancer that is for instance you know there are many things that we can do through digital that are much better and cost less where the problem becomes a bit complicated in my view and it's also because again you know member states it's digital should not be only about reduction of costs in my view digital needs also to be about better quality of treatment so can I say that this will be with the companies because, you know, many uh, medical devices and many elements that feed into medicines, you know, this world is a continuum. Eh? We should not be deluded that the medicine is here and then you have a device and then you have digital. No, no, this is a continuum. And in this spectrum, we need to uh, find the balance between reduction of costs, which is all possible with digitalization, but let's say keeping the quality and and to have the very good quality everywhere in europe the vast program i would say vast program but digital 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 i we need we need that as the backbone for the the modernization the future proofing of our of our legislation for sure by the way somebody uh, alluded to the green transition green transition and digital transition are the two pillars of this current commission work so let me say they are they are somehow feeding into each other so i i expect that there will be elements of green transition in all that we will see because you know um, a reduction of uh, of uh, carbon dioxide can also come with a certain approach to production that is much much more targeted so i'm an optimist and in my view these two transitions feed into each other feed into each other that's uh, fantastic. I think we've been shown by, by both the speakers' comments, but also actually the huge range of questions that we've had coming in, just quite how much there is on people's minds and that they want to discuss. And I'm afraid that if we were doing this in real life, I would say to you, and, and now go and get your copies and grab the speakers and ask the questions that we didn't get to get to. But unfortunately, we can't do that at the moment, although I hope we will at some point. But I think it's been a really fantastic discussion. You know, um, the panelists have all brought very sort of different approaches, but sort of agree on how there is a need for, for more investment in innovation and, and more sort of innovative ways of thinking about getting that investment rather than just whining about it people not being, uh, Europe not having its own NASDAQ, um, more, more thoughts about connecting that innovation to access and um, and how sort of patchy access can be across the continent um, and complicated um, and, and more emphasis on, on cooperation between the industry and, and policy makers on many fronts, including the digital. Uh, we've certainly learned that it's very complicated that we can't, for Europe, take a model like the US or China off the shelf and, and implement it here. It will have to be um, very much adapted to the circumstances. But I'm, I'm really glad that we've had this conversation. I'm grateful for the speakers and for um, for all the questions and for our partner in this FPA. Um, so thank you all and um, I hope you'll have a great rest of your day. <laughs>